Hello, uh, welcome to the recorded version of the open house. Um, this is an opportunity to learn about the agency, about why I started it, uh, you know, what we're trying to do, how we are doing it. And um, I do live versions of these open houses regularly. So if you're able to attend, great, but this is a, an opportunity to um, see that same presentation and uh, view it. And of course, after this, I'm sure if you had some, I'm sure you'll have some questions, you're welcome to reach out and uh, we can continue the dialogue. So I have a, a slide deck that I will be uh, sharing and presenting. Okay, and so yeah, this is uh, again, this will be about an hour, this presentation, and um, again, just to give you a bit of an idea of the agency, what we do and how we do it, and this is some of the information here in my background, um, and so after this presentation, if you do have any questions or you just want to connect, you're welcome to, to email me. All right, so, you know, I've been in the field now over 20 years um, in the social service sector, and I've seen a lot of great things, a lot of great people doing great work, um, you know, a lot of great services, but I've also done a lot of, you know, work in different areas and seen a lot of the same observations and a lot of, uh, you know, the literature that I would come across that would often talk about the same things. And... And these are some of the, you know, the, we'll call them the shortcomings, some of the barriers that, you know, our clients are often facing when they're, they're struggling, you know, that they're, they're looking for services that are, um, you know, that are meeting their needs, but often some of those are uh, coming up a bit short, um, and often very short. And for some, it's working really well, and that's fantastic. And, um, and we want to continue to, to, do what works well for clients, but also recognize that if there are certain things within our systems that, that don't work. Uh, this comes from observations um, I've had, again, over 20 years. I've worked in uh, adult community corrections as a probation officer. I've done some work in victim services. I've done hospital social work. I've worked in counseling and nonprofit, counseling at a few other sort of agencies. Uh, research projects, looking at intimate partner violence in uh, uh, cultural communities, South Asian in this case, where um, I was, again, observing certain things and, and reading certain things and hearing from colleagues in the field and academics and clients about some of the struggles they were having um, or some of the issues that they were encountering when they were um, you know, needing services. And so um, it's not just my observation for sure, but in many ways it is, right? It's my, it's, these are things that I've observed. Others may feel otherwise, and I'm always open to, to hearing other perspectives and even, you know, healthy debates on some of these, uh, any of the things I say, actually. So in my experience, a lot of services tend to be triage where you have some great people who are incredibly skilled in what they do as therapists and social workers. But because the need is so great, they're often kind of having to kind of triage and sort of determine who's eligible for services and where they should go for services. And if they're not, you know, like to be sort of referred maybe somewhere else or, or you know, whatever else may happen. So there's a tendency for a lot of that, you know, kind of figuring out where someone should go rather than just being able to support them. And I get it when you have a lack of resources um, you know, need far outstripping resources, then you tend to do triage to figure out where people need to go. Um, but in many ways, I feel it also limits the ability of those folks doing triage because they're so capable of doing so much more rather than just that, you know, quick assessments and and then, you know, referrals out or, or whatever else may happen. So I feel like they're not always being utilized, those very skilled clinicians, um, because again, they've been put into this role of doing triage. Uh, when you have needs outstripping resources, then you tend to have an emphasis on more of the short-term solution focused approaches, which makes sense again, 
you know, from a fiscal perspective, it's the most bang for your buck, but it's not, in my experience, working for many folks that may need, you know, therapies that are go beyond that. You know, short-term solution focused approaches are fantastic. There's great, but they tend to be emphasized, not because they're they're, you know, they have more evidence than others. It's just because again, they tend to be the most um, you know, it's getting the the, the most uh, services provided for those limited resources. Um, but, you know, as you have limited resources, again, you tend to establish eligibility criteria. And again, I've been around long enough to see how eligibility criteria has changed significantly over the years, you know, where if you had presented with ABC symptoms 20 years ago, there's a good chance you would have got a service. And now today, there's a good chance you won't get that service, that same kind of service, because again, just the needs um, outstrip resources. And so you set up these eligibility criteria, and often it's a, a matter of, you know, assessing someone and that maybe they're they're not sick enough to get a service, frankly, you know, is how the sometimes the implication, or that sometimes they're too sick, or maybe, you know, they weren't sick enough today, and then they're turned away, and then they come back a year later, and now suddenly they're too sick. So it's just, again, a system that I struggle with, and I've struggled with for years, and you know, setting up these eligibility criteria, check marks that somebody has to meet, you know, and it's often established, yes, that makes sense by funders, but often the funders that are, um, you know, setting up this criteria aren't necessarily the ones that know what's happening out in the community, you know, certainly not to the same extent as some of the, you know, the frontline folks. Uh, and so, again, needs of strip resources, so you end up putting people on wait lists, and sometimes wait lists can be significant, and I think, again, the implication for a client is sometimes, well, my needs aren't so important. And so I've been, you know, I have to wait. And in the meantime, you know, someone's sitting on a wait list and they're struggling and they're suffering. And it already took so much courage to reach out for help. And then to be put on a wait list or be turned away outright is, I think, incredibly debilitating. And, and I've struggled with that for years, you know, being in positions where I was making those decisions and really, really feeling increasingly distressed having to to do that right and 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 make those decisions that didn't sit well with me um, as much as we know over the years for sure we recognize the interconnections between um, physical and mental health we still tend to have separate services for each and you know as much as we recognize that they're they're interconnected that when you're physically suffering it impacts your mental well-being and when you're suffering with, with uh, mental health, it, it will impact you physically, it will impact your sleep and, and just your energy levels and, you know, what you're eating or not eating. And, and so they're connected, but too often still they're, um, the services are, are separated and we're not really working in a holistic mind-body way. Um, an individualistic approach, um, I can provide an example in a bit here, but like a lot of our services is as much, there's an implication almost like you're the sick person, so you need to deal with it as opposed to looking at it as from a, you know, a familial or a family systems approach or a community approach or a larger societal approach. We, we individualize people. And, you know, for those that, I think we all have some degree of individualism and collectivism in our outlooks, but our system tends to be very much emphasizing individualism, which I don't think actually fits any community. You know, I think it's, you know, as I mentioned, we all have elements of individualism and collectivism in our worldviews, and yet individualism really, really got entrenched in our systems, and they tend to be the, the sort of the way that systems are delivered, even though, again, it's not really fitting the needs of our communities. Uh, just the, the lack of integration. You have so many different services, and they all have different mandates. They all have different service criteria, all the things I've already talked about. And often they're just not integrated. So clients have to go, you know, for one service, they go somewhere, another service, they go somewhere else, and they're going all across town. And often it's Monday to Friday, you know, nine to five, and it impacts work and other obligations. And so it's it's just a, a system that I, sell, I often say, like, I'm grateful for where I live and we have the services we have. But I push against the idea that, you know, they're ideal and that there isn't room for improvement. And that's why I, 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 you know, that's very much what moving forward is about is we're not saying that the whole system is, is um, 
severely flawed. I think there are flaws within the system. Um, but where we're looking at it is how do we contribute to a more integrated holistic holistic system of support? And then the lack of language supports for those communities that could benefit from services in their first language. And those are often very neglected communities. And there's an impact not on just on that individual, but you know, the, the next generations. And so you have uh, intergenerational traumas that have never really been addressed in a in a culturally or linguistically responsive way, and it, it will continue to impact future generations. I can speak, uh, you know, on each of those topics, I could spend an hour, and I, of course, won't. This entire presentation will be about an hour, but uh, just to kind of, you know, get across that there's there's so much complexity to each of those points that uh, there's a lot that we could say about each of them. But, um, and so these are just brief overviews and, you know, kind of bringing it to something I often saw, you know, is working with and seeing, you know, not just a client, but a client who was part of a family, who was part of an extended family, who often had their extended family reaching out or their spouse or their, you know, their partner reaching out you know, that we would, I would encounter families that were struggling again with maybe intergenerational trauma or the mental illness of someone that was not really treated or substance use that might have uh, even been a symptom of someone's um, traumas that they were trying to, you know, in a, in a certain way, um, maladaptively cope. And, and so the example I've often used is ones that I would see in my um, uh, adult probation work. I often, and we're we're using an example just for the sake of this this point, um, like a nuclear family. Even though, of course, that's not the that's not the the norm by any means. And families come in so many different shapes and sizes. And um, but just just for this one, I'll kind of um, use that example um, where I worked with a you know say a, a male who had assaulted his uh, partner, his female partner. And of course, there's no, there's no excuse for that. There's no, um, you know, that's not okay in, in any way, shape or form. And the, the male had been um, put on a court order to get some counseling. Uh, I'd often have the victim reach out as well and say, look, okay, he's getting counseling, but I'm, I'm you know, she, she's decided to stay in this relationship. And, you know, I, I want, I want counseling as well. And at the time, this is many years ago, maybe things have changed, but it was a bit disheartening that we, uh, um, you know, it's it's a government system. It's very hierarchical. Certainly, um, corrections uh, is that way, and so you know, had to go up a chain of command. And the eventual answer was no. If they, if the victim wants help, she needs to get it through victim services, and that just never sat well with me. You know, for a, a system that purports to be victim centered and supporting the, the needs of victims, you know, it didn't sit well with me that. A victim is, was telling us what they wanted and we were turning around saying, no, that's not what you get or you need to go somewhere else for that. And victim service work is immensely uh, necessary and, and great and and, um, and so important. And, and But it's not necessarily counseling. It's court accompaniment. It's, um, you know, safety planning, again, very important. But that's not necessarily what often these victims were asking for, in my experience. Um, they could benefit from it, but they were also wanting counseling. And so again, they were turned away. And then I thought, okay, and then if there's kids involved. They were often, you know, getting potentially, they were referred to the Ministry for Children and Families or uh, school-based counseling. And again, I was starting to, you know, the more work I did, I was hearing how many, you know, wait lists there were and criteria for service. So you had this family that was often, you know, like trying to heal from what was going on for them and trying to, um, you know, work as a family to try to heal. And I'm not saying the family should be seen together. You know, there's different dynamics, but our system will often say again, okay, you know, dad, you go through criminal justice, mom, you go through uh, victim services, kids, you go through ministry or school counseling. And again, there's, there's criteria for service. So just because, you know, you're referred doesn't mean you'll get a service. And even if you are eligible, you will be waiting. So there was this family that was trying to get supports together and we were individualizing them and we were, um, you know, sending them all across town. And again, you know, Monday to Friday, nine to five, typically and creating additional stressors on this particular family. And again, the intervention was very individualized and not necessarily even, you know, meeting the needs of 
what the, the, the clients actually wanted. And so these are observations again over the years, and I, I was increasingly struggling with that and um, experiencing what I would term moral distress. I didn't know it at the time, and I, I learned later through a workshop that I was uh, at that that's what a lot of folks are experiencing. Like they know what their clients need. They know that there's a good chance they could actually provide it, but because of their job description or because of just these kinds of, you know, uh, um, things that I've mentioned before about limits on number of sessions and people having to wait a long time or fit all this eligibility criteria or not meeting it, their needs in a culturally or linguistically responsive way. You know, the, the folks are that do this work are often experiencing this distress, right? And it's it's impacting. Um, it could lead to burnout. You know, I, I I think it does for some folks, but for me, it didn't lead to burnout. It just led to this, you know, this kind of increasing awareness that some of the stuff we were doing wasn't necessarily as effective as it could be. And yes, we need more funding, but I also felt it was just a we needed to do things differently, and it didn't necessarily need a massive amount of funding. We need more people hired for sure, more counselors, social workers, uh, peer support, social service workers, absolutely. That's, you know, I, I will continue to advocate for that, but I also think the system could change in ways that wouldn't require a huge amount of funding. It just needs, there needs to be the will to do so. It needs to, you know, challenge the status quo. And, and there's a few other things I'll talk about, but, uh, um, yeah, I just going back to this family that needs help, but rather than work with them as a family and see their, you know, see their struggles from a, a family systems lens, we individualize. And so, you know, we will send them to places where they there's often an individual approach adopted. Uh, there's often systems that are quite bureaucratic. Uh, you know, so a lot of the a lot of the services, a lot of funding doesn't even necessarily go to the direct service um there's and then there's other agencies that are are just you know working on pennies and they're doing amazing work so i don't want to just again paint all all these kind of you know all organizations with the same brush um but bureaucracy is something that i, I i've seen plenty of like that's our policy that's our procedure and i you know i just say well that was created by someone you know many years ago it might have made sense 30 40 years ago it doesn't necessarily make sense now and it can be changed. It was created by a human being. It can change. But too often, we, I think, and I've been guilty of this too, in positions of leadership, just saying, yeah, that's our mandate or that's our funding parameters. You know, whereas it, it does take, especially people in positions of leadership, saying, well, does this even make sense? You know, can we change this? And I still think we we have a, a ways to go before we have, you know, where we get to a place where people are doing that more more consistently. Uh, within nonprofits, so I, I mean, government, there was bureaucracy, and, and I worked, I, I, I went from government to nonprofit because I really felt like I wanted to do more proactive work, you know, working in corrections. I thought, wow, you know, if we could have worked with some of these folks before they got to this place, we probably could have reduced a lot of their struggles and their suffering. Uh, so I went into nonprofit and a lot of great work as well being done. But a little disheartened sometimes where, you know, there was a lot of competition and I'm not blaming any nonprofit because it's the system. You know, there's a little bit of funding and everyone's kind of competing and often you're undercutting. And, and um, so it doesn't lead to the best relationship. So it's a system that's created a lot of these issues. But regardless of the reasons, it's, um, you know, when nonprofits choose to compete rather than collaborate, it's hurting the mutual clients that we're supposed to be helping. And, that, you know, in the end is ultimately what didn't sit well with me. Um, yeah, so even, you know, the evidence-based approaches that tend to emph emphasize short-term solution-focused approaches, you know, in a nutshell, just change your thinking about a situation and your situation will improve. I know there's more to it than that, but I still think, you know, it's a bit too much, you know, there's, there's just so many other um uh, factors that impact a person and to kind of just look at it as well they just need to change some of their approach or you know use some of these more solution focused approaches again they're all effective and great but you know to to emphasize those and de-emphasize other effective approaches I, I have a bit of a problem with and so yeah how is that helping like these were folks that were again there's no excuse for violence if that's what's occurred and 
you know, as much as we may, you know, want the 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 victim to to get out of a situation like that, they, they if they choose to stay, then how do we support them in the, that way and, and keep them safe and give them the support they, they need and their children? And, you know, ultimately, if we're wanting to, um, you know, support the, all the different clients we have, then we have to look at ways to support them that's um, goes beyond, you know, reactive, individualistic, short-term services, wait lists, restrictive criteria, um, you know, that uh, there's there's value to those, but not if we're just emphasizing those and, again, de-emphasizing other equally effective approaches. And this is just, you know, something I did some research again, I mentioned, you know, on intimate partner violence, and this was one of the you know, some of the literature I read that that's where I was really, you know, emboldened to to really advocate for these things, because that's what all the research says. We need more integrated systems of support. So not just in criminal justice, but absolutely in criminal justice, but uh, others as well, you know, that any, any, you know, mental health or substance use issue will, you know, it'll cut across education, it'll cut across health, it'll uh, ministry for human and social development, like social services. Uh, there's so many different kind of um, ministries and, and, you know, it impacts businesses and, 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 um, and yet we just don't have a, a really integrated, coordinated system of support, despite evidence. So this is research from, or this, you know, this uh, literature is 15 plus years old. And I'm sure even before that, there was these calls. And yet here we are still so many years later. And, and uh, yeah, there's been improvement. And I'm, I'm always excited to see some of the improvements we've seen. But I still feel it's coming very slowly. And, and I don't think it has to be that way. And it just takes the will and it takes coordination to, to, to change that. And, um, you know, not just relying on the status quo and the same old, same old, which um, too often that seems to be the pattern that continues to sort of perpetuate itself. So I've said a lot of things that sound maybe negative, but I, I'm going to bring it, you know, around a bit and, and, and it's not, it's meant to be constructive and it certainly didn't debilitate me. It didn't burn me out. It's just, I was emboldened because I was hearing and reading the same thing over and over and observing the same thing. And, and so to me, it was like, okay, if we're all saying these things, then, then what do we need to do differently? And again, I still think it, the hardest thing to change is the status quo. It's, you know, bureaucracies that are entrenched, you know, that this is how we've always done things. So that's how we're going to continue to do it. And that to me is the, the biggest struggle. You know, the rhetoric is always there. Like, yes, we need to work in a, you know, collaborative way, coordinated way. But I still think the action isn't quite matching the rhetoric. <laughs> And, you know, the, the the tried and true, we'll call it, the things that people have done historically and, you know, over many, many years is still um, the norm. And I say we're often using um, 20th century solutions for 21st century problems because, you know, these are, again, systems that were set up decades and decades ago, and they've, they've kind of become entrenched in how we do things. And we're just not really um making major shifts to change that i think we are i think again there's recognition and awareness and there is talk but it has to go beyond talk and some other quotes that i'm really fond of and, and use often is that it, and i think it speaks to what i've already said that you know people don't just lead single issue struggles it, it, there's there's it's there's so much more complex and so um there's no such thing as a single issue struggle because we don't live single issue lives. So when we individualize things and we say, okay, you go here for mental health and you go there for substance use and you go there for uh, intimate partner violence, like they're all, there's often interconnections and uh, concurrent, um, you know, factors there. And, and there is again, recognition and there's some really good innovative work being done in that regard, but I still feel it's, it's you know, it's a bit slow to get to that point and it's a long time coming. And that if we're going to continue to use the same approaches we've been using, then we're not necessarily going to be able to um, make this, 
major systemic changes that I feel are are needed. And I'm not going to sit here and say that, you know, moving forward, family services has, has figured it out and has done it. But I feel like we are one of the, I think, leaders towards that change. And that part's exciting where we got a long ways to go. But there's some really, I think, innovative, creative things we're doing to, um, you know, push towards systemic change. And if it doesn't happen, then, you know, at least we're still doing some you know amazing things and we'll continue to do that. And there's other agencies as well. And that's exciting too, having like-minded agencies that are also, you know, joining us in this mission to kind of uh, address the needs of underserved communities. And so what is Moving Forward? It's an agency that was started again based on my observations i had great mentors when i was doing my practicums and i always look forward to the opportunity when i had the chance to 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 mentor as well you know to go from being the mentee to the mentor and i so i yeah when i was able to i'd have enough years experience i started doing that and i was at an agency where i again i was having this distress of turning people away or putting them on wait list until i realized hey i have these students that are here and I could just have the students see them because my staff were already full and beyond capacity. Um, and so I had these students, but I also was starting to observe that I had often complex cases and I would consider who the best person would be to support that complex case. And quite often it was the student, regardless of what my staff in their caseload was like, I felt like the student might've been lacking in experience, the student counselor uh, or social worker, but they were, their ability to create safe space, their knowledge of, of current you know, therapies and just the energy that they could bring to the placement was just uh, so impressive. And to the, again, to the point where I often considered them the, the best resource. So it wasn't just that, hey, you know, these are clients that, uh, okay, I'll just hand them to the student that somehow it's a, a drop off in quality. I didn't feel that at all. I felt it was very comparative. And then over the years, it's come to my attention that there's a great body of evidence that shows uh, student counselors with the right supervision and support have client outcomes that are very much comparable to, you know, seasoned counselors in the field. And so it really speaks to the quality of the therapeutic relationship and that ability to create safe space. And, you know, sadly, there's a lot of folks in the field through no fault of theirs, but they're they're burning out. And some then, you know, when you start to burn out, even before you get to that place, the, the quality of your work will be affected. And it will, of course, impact the clients. And so, you know, for me, I it was, um, you know, I just saw this great resource. And um, I, that's what I decided to do. The other thing I observed was, you know, even including my experience, like I was given this holistic training, you know, as are all these students that have opportunities to learn about how to work with, you know, children, youth, adults, uh, seniors, couples, families, extended families, um, you know, working in, in different substance use, mental health, um, intimate partner violence, like different interventions for different presenting issues. And, you know, then they are expected to go into a field where it's very individualistic, and then they have to kind of choose what they want to focus in on and I just felt like that's part of the problem is they're 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 going in to the field with these amazing skill sets and then they're being put into very limiting work and it's limiting their skill sets and then what ends up happening is a lot of people go into private practice because that's the place they can ultimately do the work that they're most passionate about and be able to work with different populations and and so we're we're losing a lot of good people and clients that are you know very vulnerable are losing some really great resources because when you, you go into the private practice field, um, you know you become inaccessible to many people. And I'm, that's not a knock against people going into the private practice field. I absolutely understand why people do it, but it's just sad to me that you know some of the people that could greatly benefit from that that therapist skill sets can no longer access their their services because of um, they don't have the income or the um, insurance to to get that service. So it's a systems issue and it's, it's certainly not a knock against folks going into private practice, but I get why, you know, they can create their own schedule, they have flexibility, they can practice in, 
and use interventions beyond you know the the one or two that the the frontline systems tend to emphasize. Uh, and again, they can work with many different populations. And so um, that's the agency, you know, that it's, we have many, many students at any given time, many, many supervisors that are amazing and are so strong clinically and have different diverse uh, backgrounds and uh, skill sets that our interns learn so much from. And something I didn't plan for. So I was, you know, again, a little frustrated with the system that I felt was not meeting the needs of communities and then i saw this amazing resource so i started the agency myself and just supervising some students having an open mandate and being very clear this is what we do and this is how we do it and then let clients decide if they don't want to work with a student counselor then that's their prerogative but i knew there was a lot of people that they, they don't really have too many other options and once they connected with that student therapist they would see just how skilled and um you know strong and and great that therapist was that student therapist was um and then over the years what i didn't plan on so, so this was planned i didn't plan on having several thousand clients and this many you know great supervisors that really supported what i was up to and sort of came on board and uh but we also had these amazing alumni grads who loved the mission loved the values and you know very much it resonated for them so after they finished their practicum they became registered and then they came back and then they started to offer sliding scale services. So that's now the agency is we we have, you know, if somebody wants long-term services, they can afford it. It's a much more affordable rate. They can see a registered therapist. If, uh, if they can't, then they can see a student. And again, the quality of service, I think is, is comparable still. It's just eventually, of course, the student graduates. So, you know, if that client is still wanting service afterwards, they would see another intern. Uh, and we will never cut somebody off if they've got lots of work to do and they want to continue to do it. But that's sort of how they would they would do it. And I don't want to devalue the work of private therapists. I have lots of peers, and colleagues that are doing amazing work. And so we're very clear. If somebody can afford private therapy, then they shouldn't be coming to us. They can look around. They've got lots of great options. They've got a great insurance plan. They've got a lot of great options. Uh, so the, the, the lower fee service we, we offer is for anyone that's low income doesn't have insurance. And if they have insurance, then I can pass them along to, you know, other other therapists that can um, tap into that. But my focus will always remain on our, you know, very no income, low income folks, you know, um, underserved communities, whether that's cultural or linguistic or, uh, you know, uh, communities of color or LGBTQ2S communities that again, have been historically you know, continue to be underserved in so many ways. And so we're trying to, yeah, we're disrupting traditional systems. We are not part of a public sector system. We are not funded by the the, the government sectors responsible for uh, public counseling. That's in BC, that's uh, health authorities, schools, you know, through education, um, corrections, and the Ministry for Children and Families. And so we don't get a single penny from those folks, yet we've had thousands and thousands of clients referred to us over the years from them and provided tens of thousands of hours of counseling to those clients without a penny. And I, you know, I used to get bugged if I used to get upset by that. I probably still do a little bit because I don't think it's fair and equitable. But again, I also love that we can provide a service without any of the bureaucracies and those kinds of um you know, those the, that status quo system that isn't necessarily, you know, addressing the needs of today's uh, communities and their complex needs. And so we, we can work outside those traditional systems while still collaborating with them, you know, and, and doing what we can to contribute to a more integrated system of support without, again, being bound by some of those, um, those systems that really make it hard to do a lot of the collaborative work um, and the low barrier support services that uh, so many of our clients need. And so how do we do it? It's it's the relationships we have with the, the students, the students coming from post-secondary institutions, uh, not just university, college as well. Um, and it's valuing what the students bring, you know, and it's then being able to do again another quote that I love, like instead of just being reactive, which a lot of our systems are, 
and funding is often very much reactive. It's, you know, things are often having to get to a very bad place before there's a recognition that something needs to be done and, you know, funding will get allotted. And often again, it's, there's again, so much harm and suffering that's taken place. And, and you know, the, the, the problem with a very reactive system is you never get in front of any issue. You're always just busy, you know, putting out fires. And so we as an agency, yes, we're getting people that are just released from the psych unit. You know, quite often we get that. And I wish we didn't. I wish they had a team of support, but often they they don't get any of that. And they're told just here's an agency that can see you. Um, so we'll, of course, help and support those folks. But we also want to get folks, you know, reach out to folks and connect with folks before they get to that place where they're, you know, in, they've had some significant uh, struggles or their, you know, their loved ones have been impacted significantly with what they're going through. So the research, um, you know, we work with agencies around, or sorry, with post-secondary institutions, you know, doing community-based research, supporting those efforts, uh, a lot of in-house training. We have group supervision almost every day, you know, really supporting our interns to, you know, in their growth and development. And then, of course, meeting the needs and providing services and not having, you know, specific mandates or deliverables. So actually, you know, having regular dialogue on what are the needs of the communities and then, you know, setting about trying to address that. And, um, you know, funding is absolutely necessary. We Again, I've, I've said we need more people doing, you know, and getting paid a very fair wage, a good wage, good benefits that are in counseling, social work and health and peer support and social services. We absolutely need that. And I will absolutely advocate for that. But in the meantime, I know there's a lot of people falling through significant gaps and, and we can do something about that. And this is how we do it because we the, whatever funding we receive, uh, you know, the cost of supervision that uh, I do share um, in, in sort of our introductory emails that I send out when people are inquiring about placements, uh, it's, um, you know, by directing our funding towards supervision, you know, we could have, um, you know, there could be like, you know, so one person could be hired. And again, we need to more of those for sure. And they say one person is hired and they are then able to see, you know, 20 people in a month or so let's say they could see 100 people in a, uh, in a in a year. So that's great. They were able to see 100 people. But we can basically use that a similar funding and get like, you know, funding for 15 to 20 part time supervisors who in turn will each see five to 10 students, uh, student counselors who in turn will see, you know, 10 or 15 clients themselves. And so the, the number of clients we can see with a similar sort of funding amount is exponentially greater. And I'm not bragging about that because, again, we need more people in the field making a good wage. But just we know the need is so great that we can continue to what we do within moving forward, seeing thousands of clients a year, and that other system can continue to still, um, you know, be doing good work. But again, the change that tends to be fairly slow within those larger systems. And so we're able to do things that you know we're not we're not bound by. Um, the those kind of check mark criteria for services so we can do more prevention work we can do early intervention we can still see people that are in you know somewhat of a, a bit of a crisis you know along the continuum we can do projects and actions you know focused on social change uh we can contribute to more holistic services by having our services uh you know at other agencies working with other agencies you know we have a lot of agencies that might do you know, they might be um, uh, primarily educational institutions or they may be support for folks who are vulnerable to homelessness or uh, folks that are neurodivergent, you know, and we are bringing in the counseling, you know, so there's th those other services and then we're bringing this other added value that again contributes to more holistic integrated supports. And we can also ease pressure off traditional systems, right? As much as I've maybe taking some shots at government systems. There's a lot of great people doing great work. I often say, you know, people care, systems don't. And so there's a lot of wonderful people within those systems that absolutely care and are doing, doing amazing work. And they're navigating some of those systemic issues and doing a great job. And if we can, you know, ease pressure off those systems, then it's it's win-win, win all around. It's win for that agency. It's win for us to be able to do what we're 
wanting to do, you know, in terms of our vision. And it's, of course, win for the clients that who otherwise wouldn't be getting support or would be waiting a very long time to get that support. And then we do a lot of in-house training. We have a lot of wonderful folks. Some are alumni. Some are just people that have seen what we do and they, they, they are contributing. You know, they're like some people can donate money. That's always lovely. But there's also amazing people that donate their skill sets or you know, if they don't donate it, they, they will offer it at a very, very reasonable rate. And so they are leaving money on the table to support the kind of things we're doing. And so I just position moving forward as, you know, not being a public sector system, not being a private, somewhere in between. I, you know, I, I, I like to say we take the best of both, right? We can be very low barrier, you know, free and low cost, you know, so the free sort of what public would do. Um, and and we take elements of private in terms of you know minimal weights, open accessibility, right? You know the opportunity to provide multiple therapeutic options. And so, if you were to join us, and you know it's not a a, a great fit for everybody. If you know there there's other great agencies again that are doing great work. So if you find another agency that better fits your you know your where you want to be kind of thing and what you're looking for, then wonderful, right? We're all in this together and, and I'm happy for you. But, you know, anyone that joins us, I think it's ultimately what we do and the mission and the vision very much resonates for them. And so if they do want to come join us, then these are some of the roles that they may play. I understand when somebody starts, when I did my practicum way back, I was nervous and that's understandable. And so we, we give folks lots of opportunities to kind of, you know, before they jump into general therapy, they're going to be able to do some scripted programs, uh, scripted intake. We have these psychoeducation programs that are scripted. And so those are some opportunities to do that before they go into the a more general therapy where, you know, it's um, the others. There's there's sort of set things to do. In, in, whereas in general therapy, it's uh, very much led by what the client wants to talk about and what they've identified. Uh, and, and if somebody's ready to jump into general therapy, then great. A lot of folks aren't, and that's totally fine. But if someone is, then they can do that. Otherwise, they have, you know, a lot of other um, opportunities to, to get some experience before they do that, including as well, like joining group facilitation. A lot of our groups that are run uh, are facilitated by a registered therapist. And and so, um, uh, you know, a, an experienced therapist and then the intern can join as a second or third facilitator and maybe even just observe for a little while and then if they feel comfortable, they can present. And there's other activities as well. Um, you know, each school has different criteria. There's different criteria if you're doing your social work degrees versus your counseling psych ones. And, you know, so if you have, depending on your program, you may have an opportunity to pick up hours, you know, doing workshops, doing, um, you know, outreach activities. So those opportunities also exist. And then, yeah, just contributing to a more integrated system of care. So the different agencies we work with, and this number continues to grow, you know, on a weekly basis. I do a lot of just engagement these days. You know, once I got the agency up and going and I got amazing people kind of filling in and helping and supporting, and I was able to kind of subcontract and get some, you know, some of those, um, roles filled to kind of keep the operations going, it allows me to kind of continue to build on the original vision, which was, again, you know, low barrier services and um, an integrated system of support. So developing relationships. So, you know, even if you don't join us, but and if, if you do great, but even if you know of an organization that can benefit from what we do, then by all means, feel free to connect me to them. I'm, I will always make time to connect with anyone to talk about what we do and how it could, you know, it could benefit the clients they work with. So just some examples, I won't go over this, I won't spend much time here, but just some of the, you know, postings we have on social media and things that we're doing, different programs, you know, different ways we can support our alumni when they're doing workshops or trainings and, you know, and again, they're supporting us by providing a low, low fee, low barrier type of, uh, training or workshop or whichever and so you know the the relationship very often continues well beyond you know the the internship for somebody 
and just again more opportunities and workshops and trainings and things we're doing and these are some of the coaching programs so we discovered that a lot of our clients you know yes they can benefit from therapy but they could also benefit from like tangible skills that will help them manage their stresses in a more effective way or you know improve their intimate relationships or their you know some of their parenting and engaging with their children you know you know learning uh, mindfulness techniques so we have these scripted programs that uh, clients are often accessing therapy and you know one or two coaching programs and so you know they're having multiple points of contact per week that's helping them you know keep their their mental health and well-being at an optimum level and so again a lot of these kind of programs that uh, our interns can develop or or sorry not develop um facilitate or volunteers we have as well that do that sometimes and just, yeah, as an agency, we will continue to offer, I mean, we have, you know, students across the country, we have therapists across, across the country, we have clients across the country. So online services will continue, you know, and we also have donated space in Surrey and we'll offer some in-person services and, and, you know, interns have that opportunity if they're local and they want to do in person, they have that option. Otherwise, we'll continue to have a very ro robust uh, online um, therapy service and our supervision will often be online our group supervision will be online and so we'll continue to have again a very robust online service and um and yet if somebody would benefit from in person we have fee-based services in person um, and we go case by case if somebody's really struggling and they they don't have internet or they really struggle with technology then we can accommodate them if they're local and do some in person and, you know, another quote that's one of my favorites that it really is just a few, you know, often change happens because just a few people or even one person is willing to, um, you know, sort of challenge things or at least try things differently. And, uh, and so, yeah, I never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. And then uh, this is just our... Um, our vision and mission um, statements, creating a world without sorrow. Of course, we're not going to get there, nor is that even necessarily something we need. Sorrow is an emotion that people need to feel, but if we can support people and, and just overall reduce people's suffering, then uh, we're already doing that. And so I think we're already making some, you know, doing some amazing things. Thank to, thanks to the wonderful interns and, and alumni and supervisors and our board of directors and uh, volunteers um, and our staff that are just just amazing, wonderful folks, and we'll continue to um, we'll continue to do what we do because we it's 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 again it's having an impact and it's um, it's 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 exciting to uh, as as tough as it as it is as exhausting as it can be with just the sheer number of folks that we know need our help. The fact that we can continue to uh, get them connected within days and we can often instill hope that you know we're not going to turn them away and we're not going to close the door on them and uh, we're in a place I, I I'll just mention as well like with a little bit of funding uh, support and philanthropy that we're always grateful for and always can benefit from you know we're at a place now that whenever the, a client comes through an intake comes through or a referral I review those and I can look at the case and then I can decide who I think will be the best fit and if it's a student, great, you know, a student on our on, on unpaid practicums, the student can see them. But if I think a one of our therapists, our grads, our alumni, excuse me, would be a better fit, then I can use the funds we have to pay that therapist at the subsidized rate they offer. And so that's exciting to me that, you know, when I first started, we, the client came, they're going to see a student because that's all we had. And then once we had alumni join us, well, if they could afford it, then they could see the alumni. Uh, now it's like it's just whoever I think is the best fit can see the client and if the client can pay great uh, they can pay the, the the therapist directly but if they can't then the agency can do that so you know that flexibility of not being so bureaucratic and just it's not just it's not a one-size-fits-all that we can look at each individual and determine you know what they're um, who's best to support them so that's, you know, an exciting place to be as an agency after 
you know, our seven or eight years of existence. And I look forward to being able to continue to do some really impactful work. So thanks for, uh, thanks for watching the video and feel free to reach out if you have any questions or thoughts or you'd like to, you know, maybe explore an internship with moving forward. Thanks.